I like to invite the children forward. And, and we have a birthday boy today. Is he in here? Is he going to come up? Can we sing? Okay. We'll do that at the end of the children's time, okay? All right. How's everybody doing? Glenn, it's so good to see you. Is Daniel so good at the guitar? Yeah. Yeah, do you know who helps Daniel be good at the guitar? Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of teachers he had, and also he worked hard, but also God gave him that gift, and so we need to say amen to that. Okay, so today we're learning about how to love the way that God loves, and I have a story to you about Jesus. Good morning. Jesus performed many miracles and told stories to people. Jesus wanted them to understand that he loved them and that he would take care of them. Jesus compared himself to a shepherd who watches over and cares for sheep. Just imagine what would happen if she, if she didn't have a shepherd. One of the sheep might wander off and get lost or hurt or even eaten by a wild animal. Jesus knew people were a lot like sheep, so he told them this story. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The hired worker is not like the shepherd. He does not own the sheep, so he does not care about that. When he sees a wolf coming, he leaves the sheep alone and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and the sheep scatter. The man runs away because he just gets paid to do the job. He doesn't care about the sheep enough to risk his life for them. But I am a good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. I love my sheep and I'm willing to give my life for them. I have other sheep that don't belong to this group. I want to bring them into my flock. They too will listen to my voice. And there should be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I love my sheep and I will give my life for them. When Jesus finished the story, some people didn't understand what Jesus was trying to explain, but others understood that he was the Son of God, our Savior, and the way to eternal life. See that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So we are learning how to love people the way that Jesus loved people, and part of that is singing happy birthday to a one-year-old little guy who's coming up at the front here, Daniel. You want to? This is Jojo. We sing happy birthday to Joseph. I 
preached on that this morning. Now please hear the scripture lesson. A favorite? Callie, you've got a classic. Did you know that? Yeah, you do. From 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding going or a praying symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy, only a resounding oh, and can phantom of all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, if I give all of possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It does. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Always trusts. Always hopes, always curses. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass comes when what it is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three mean faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. <clears throat> Sporadically, as we become aware of it and 
often kind of last minute because it depends upon the schedule and the volunteers and the weather and things like that. But we've been able to go and to bless some people doing this Neighbors Helping Neighbors ministry. Neighbors Helping Neighbors is the same name of the ministry that we do up in Maine for one week every summer. And so it's nice to have a local expression of that here. So about a year and a half ago, uh, I think, we were working on a house over on the west side of town and doing a fair number of projects there, replacing a door and replacing some deck, and took off an entire porch, actually, to help at that house. So it was many days of work. And one of the ways to help support this work, if you're not somebody who swings a hammer, is you can help provide food for the workers for lunch. And so I said, on Saturday I'm going to go and I'll bring lunch to that work crew. So Saturdays for us is basically trips back and forth up Haverhill Street to the Karate Dojo and back over and over again. So I get my kids all suited up uh, with their karate gear and I get the lunch ready and I pick somebody up and drop somebody off. Lunch is in the back of the van. And eventually end up at this friend's house. And as I was driving up to the house, I had my daughter Lucy in the back and I was thinking, gosh, to be honest, I feel kind of awkward about this. Like when we go and do missions up in Maine with Neighbors Helping Neighbors, we're helping people we don't know and we're not really going to see again. And it's a little funny to walk into somebody's house and they'll be like, I'm here to help you, little lady, you know? And they're like, oh, thank you. You know, and you try to sort of bridge that gap because there's an inequality there. But those are people way up in Maine. This is someone in North Reading, right? This is somebody I can see. And I wonder if it's going to be awkward for them or for me. So I'm driving up with my food. And we get to the house, and Lucy says, as we're pulling in, oh, my friend lives here. And I said, what? She said, yeah, we come here every day with the school bus to pick up a friend of mine for school. I said, you, you go to school with a girl who lives in this house? And she said, yes. And I was like, that is so good. Like, now I have a way in to talk to the person who lives in the house, an easy way, because we have daughters the same age. So we get there, I pack the food, and I'm talking to the owner of the home. And she says, oh, I really, really appreciate this, and you know, really wish that there was something that I could do to return the favor. And, you know, I said, well, we do this because we love God, right? And that, so we love our neighbors and we're happy to do it. Um, we certainly don't need to do anything to pay us back. And she looks over and there's this really tall, skinny pear tree in her yard that's absolutely covered in pears. And she said, well, won't you take some pears from my pear tree? And I said, okay, sure, you know. And so I, we got, there were a bunch on the ground too. Uh, three or four of them, because that's about how many pears you can eat, right? Three or four pears. She said, oh no, that's not enough pears for you to take. Hang on. She goes to the house and she gets two big paper shopping bags from Bed Bath & Beyond. Well, for the big kind, not the small kind from Trader Joe's. Big. And she fills them up. She has like a wheelbarrow. One of her daughters is helping. They're going around her little wagon filling up. She must have given me 15 pounds of pears. Like these two huge bags of pears. And I was like, Thank you. <laughs> like, what are you supposed to say? You can't say, no, I don't want all these. So I'm like, thank you so much for the pair. <coughs> so we get home and I'm looking at these big bags and I think, if you know me, you know that I'm thrifty and I don't like to throw things out. So I was like, what am I going to do with all these pairs? <coughs> I had some canning jars left over from the a very <coughs> failed attempt at trying to can the year before. And I thought, well, maybe I'm going to try to see if I can can the pair. So I Googled it. You have to make a simple syrup, boil it, let the jars close. Those of you who can know this. And so I put up maybe six big mason jars of pears. So it's a couple days later, and we run out. My kids love canned fruit. If you have little kids, you know they love canned fruit because it's like candy and it's like sugar, right? And so I know that they like canned pears, but are they going to like this type? And I have so many. So I open up a jar and I put it out. And I say, these are from the pear trees at my friend's house. And they loved them. It was like a different variety of pears, a little more flavorful. And they're like, oh, mom, this is so good. This is great. And we want the pears all the time. It was such a blessing. It was such a gift. Such a gift to my kids. The fruit from that pear tree was a gift to our family. As Christians, we're called to be people who produce fruit. Not the kind of fruit that you eat. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Fruits of the Spirit. We're supposed to be like trees that, that not only flower and look lovely, but go a step in maturity beyond the flowering to produce a fruit 
They can be given to someone else, to bless someone else, to encourage them, to sustain them, to build them up. We're supposed to have something we can give away. And the cool thing about that fruit, when it's given away, is that it contains a seed inside of it. And that seed might have the opportunity to plant, be planted and take root in someone else. So when we're a mature Christian, we're a fruit-bearing Christian, have the fruits of the Spirit, we have these gifts to give away that may also be planted in someone's life and take root there and find an expression. Remember the first time, um, oh, the fruit that we're going to be talking about today, the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to be talking about today is love. And for the next nine weeks, minus Easter, uh, the next nine weeks we're going to be talking about different fruits of the Spirit that are exhibited in people's lives. So the fruit of love is our topic today. Cal did a gorgeous job with kind of a long passage uh, here. But Paul, if you sort of break out <coughs> that sentence, it's helpful for me, it's so long to kind of spell out what does Paul say love is and what does Paul say love isn't. So love is patient and kind. It does delight in the truth. It protects, it trusts, it hopes, and it perseveres. I think any of us would agree with this. We say, I try to love. I try to be patient. I try to be truthful. I try to be hopeful. We all agree with that. In the middle, that's the beginning and the end. In the middle, there's all these things that love isn't. It's not envious and boast. It's not proud in a bad way. Proud. It doesn't dishonor or tear down other people. It doesn't promote yourself over other people. It doesn't get angry easily, and it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I think that's where the real challenge is. I want to share with you a story of a time that someone gave me a mature love fruit that impacted me, that took root in my life. And this is when I was in seminary, and I was working at a church in Northern Virginia, and um, lived with my girl. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I think, and so you remember this man that I'm talking about. Uh, there was an associate pastor at the church who was retired, and he just came back to keep pastoring because he liked to pastor. Very distinguished, elegant gentleman. You know men who can wear rings what really well? Do you know what I mean? They're like a tie. Just very elegant. Hugh Winston was his name, Pastor Winston. And I was the youth director in the church, and there was a family in that church, the Kirkman's, you remember? <laughs> who really just had a lot. Just um, emotionally unhealthy dynamics throughout the whole family and this expressed in the kids that they brought to youth group. And that's real, and I'm glad that they were in the church because hopefully the church is a good environment for them. But it made it really challenging for me as a youth group leader. And the mother had just done something so unfair to me, uh, I felt, and well, she did. It was unfair. <laughs> she really treated me badly and she accused me of a bunch of stuff I didn't do and she had said that her daughter was purely innocent and I was purely wrong and all these things. And I was so upset, I was so angry at how I had been treated by this family that was already so much work. And so I storm into Pastor Winston's office and I was like, phew, I was so upset about this. And there he is, all elegant, his hands crossed with his rings and his tie and his collar, calm. I said, this is what they did, and this is what she's saying, and it's false, and it's wrong, and can we kick people out of the church, because I really don't want to, I'm serious, I was like, I really don't think you're healthy for this church, because, you know, nobody likes them, and I don't like them, and they're lying about what I did, and I'm so mad, and I was ready for him to say, you're right, and let's figure out how to get them out of the church, right? And he listened to me, and he's just so gentle, like a grandfather, and he said, well, the question is, Rachel, is how do we minister to these people? How do we love them? And I was like, what? I mean, it just pulled me up short. Are you kidding me? They're wrong. They're bad. We don't want them. How do we minister to them? It's like he handed me a piece of fruit. And I'll tell you, that seed is one that did take root in me. I'm still working on that. But that is an example of a mature Christian having the fruit of love to be able to share and a seed planted in somebody else. Blew me away. So as Christians, we're called to be like these trees that don't just flower, that produce fruit. And today, we're talking about the fruit of love in people. I described the positive attributes of love that we can agree on, and I talked about those, those things that love isn't, it isn't envious or boastful, dishonoring, self-seeking, things like that. 
Those are the ones that trip us up more. We can agree that we should be patient and kind, but when it comes to not boasting or not putting other people down, we start to trip up. I know that my kids can break most of the things on these lists in three minutes over cereal at breakfast time, every day. They're like arguing, right? And you see this happen. And you did this, and you spelled my mouth, and you always, and you never, and blah, 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 blah. Like, arguing. Like, too much information, by the way. I mean, they're not in here. You don't know this, okay, just between us. But um, like two days ago, I don't know why Lucy Cowell and Eva are all in the bathroom together. Lucy, you have to flush the toilet. You never flush the toilet. I always flush the toilet. You didn't flush the toilet two times yesterday. Like this, going back and forth, picking at each other, keeping records of wrong, you know, tearing each other apart. And we work so hard as parents, so hard to instill this characteristic of love, to start to see it grow in our kids. You know, they can be rocket scientists and they can be the fastest marathon on time at their high school, but please let them be loving, right? And so we work so hard to just pour this into our kids and they fight and they fight and they fight. And then, one day, somebody falls down and is crying and the other person actually puts down their device and their electronic device and goes up to the bedroom and gets lovey and brings lovey down and says, I'm sorry that you're hurt. Here's your stuffed animal, and comforts them, and serves them, and you think, oh, oh, there it is, the little tiny berry at the end of the branch, the little tiny piece of fruit, <laughs> that's what I've been working for, I'm so happy, and then like four minutes later, he's <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like straight up hell with these kids trying to mature them into people who can produce love. And it's just so hard, it's so much work. Like, I, maybe they're just not going to be cut out. Maybe there's mean kids. Maybe they should kick out of the church. <laughs> maybe there's mean kids and they're never going to get there. It can be discouraging. Sometimes fruit takes a really long time. What about in our communities, our town, state, nation, where we hear these discussions? Dishonoring, people are dishonoring, they are boasting, they are lying, they're easily angry, they keep records of wrongs. You see this all over. It's like the news is just horrifying because it's so lacking in love. It turns our stomach into knots. When are we going to be able to be more loving as a nation, as a state, as a town? And we think, well, maybe it's just not going to happen. Maybe this is just the way the world is. Forget about it. I don't want to keep trying about this because I'll just give up. Because we just turn into an unloving culture. Sometimes it takes too long, too long to feel like it's worth it. Or what about in ourselves, right? Because we know ourselves the very best. And so we are pretty aware of where we fall short if we look at this list of characteristics. And we know how many years we've been falling short and how we do it again and again. For me, the worst one is keeping record of wrongs. And it's like an Excel spreadsheet of Sam's wrongs. In case you're wondering, like spirals the computer, like the list number 49 for this week, right? Like the guy, and I told him I was going to say this. We talked about it before church. Why was he fast with his rebuttal? And I said, you have a list of wrongs too, you back off. But how many times do I get in the car and the gas gauge is down here? Both cars, the one I drive more, the one he drives more. How many times do I get the gas? All the time, every time I get the gas. He lets it go all, and then, the, you know the big fat line at the very bottom with the letter E, you know? It's like resting right on top of that. And he says, well, I've never run out of gas, and we have run out of flour. <laughs> By the way, when you get in the car tomorrow morning, it's really low on gas. Right? And maybe you've lived with somebody and like you always empty the dishwasher or you're always the one to take out the trash. You're like, why am I always the one doing that? It's keeping a record. It starts to tarnish your relationship, right? You start to get angry. And if you're sitting there saying, I've never had that problem about unloading the dishwasher and taking out the trash, it's because you're the guilty party. <laughs> But when you start doing that, you start keeping those spreadsheets of wrongs, it starts to tarnish the relationship, right? And so sincerely, like I can say, God, I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do that. Please 
don't let me hold on to this stuff. I want to just be more loving. You know, and I might try, and then, you know, a couple days later, there I am, firing up at the cell <laughs> with another wrong thing. And so I can be discouraged. I say, maybe, you know, we're supposed to be more like Jesus, but maybe I'm just <laughs> definitely not getting there, right? It's not going to happen with me. Because sometimes fruit just takes so long. So does anybody know with a real fruit tree, how long it takes for a fruit tree to bear fruit? You got any horticulturals out here? You know, Jesus preached to farmers. They would have known this right away. We have to do our research on it. I looked it up. Um, the fastest trees to produce fruit are citrus trees. They can produce the first year that they're planted. Um, slowest, cherries, and pineapple. It can be up to seven years. And so when somebody plants a cherry tree or a pineapple tree, they're in it for the long haul. They're in it really caring for that tree and pruning it and fertilizing it and whatever, all the things you do. None of us know. We don't do this. But do all the things you do for seven years until it's finally going to produce a fruit. And is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah, it is to get that fruit. So I got curious as I was researching this sermon. And I thought, I wonder if anybody knows, namely Google, I wonder if Google knows uh, what the oldest fruit tree is that's been planted. i got to share this with you. The oldest fruit tree is a pear tree. And it's located, well, what came up was oldest fruit tree in North America. Okay, there may be an older one somewhere. But pear tree, <coughs> it's less than 30 minutes from here. In Danvers, Massachusetts. So it makes sense. We remember our history, right? Okay. Um, then at 1630 by Governor Endicott, I found just this one minute video because now we're going to have a field trip. <laughs> Show us the video. Now. States is still standing as a historical landmark. A pear tree known to have been planted by John Endicott in Danvers, Massachusetts 383 years ago is still producing fruit after all these years. It is called the Endicott Pear Tree and has enjoyed quite a bit of notoriety over the years for predating the establishment of the U.S. itself. Endicott planted and grew the tree himself from an imported European pear sapling. After planting the tree around 1630, Endicott is quoted as saying, I hope the tree will love the soil of the old world, and no doubt when we have gone, the tree will still be alive. President John Adams reportedly received a special delivery of pears from the tree in 1809. It has survived many hurricanes and storms, a vandalism attack, and now the United States Department of Agriculture has made a clone of the pear tree. Anybody know about that tree before? I'm just curious. Is it really half an hour from here we should go, right? So, John Endicott had to decide to plant that pair of pear trees, knowing that it was going to be producing fruit real soon. But he did it, worked at it, and fruit came. And it was offered to the people around as gifts, as encouragement, as to build them up, right? Even sent to John Adams. How do you like that? A super famous pear tree. One thing the video doesn't cover, but we can suppose, is that when those pears are given as gifts, somebody retained the seeds. Somebody planted another pear tree. Maybe many people. Maybe people who are traveling out of state. Maybe people who are traveling across the country. It's reasonable to suppose that descendants from that pear tree have impacted this entire region. Or maybe even our whole country. And so the decision to plant that tree and to allow it to bear fruit has impacted so much further beyond John and right? And this decision to do that. And so here we see, in ourselves as living trees of faith, right? It is worth it to work on gaining the maturity so that we can bear spiritual fruit, like my friend Pastor Hugh Winston did for me. It is worth it to do that, to be able to mature to the point where we're not just 
nice looking trees with flowers, but trees that produce fruit, that give seeds, that can be planted into the lives of other people. So I want you to think carefully about this verse in 1 Corinthians 13. This is on your own time, next time you have prayer time. I love the verse, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. 1, 13, 1, 13. That's what you remember. Or just say to Google, love is patient, love is kind, and Google will pull it up like that. That's how I find all my Bible verses. <laughs> will you please look at the list? Will you say to yourself, oh, I know Rachel's bad at record of wrong, so she keeps records of wrong. What do I need to work in? What aspect of love do I need maturing in? Maybe I like to tear people down when I don't like them. Maybe I both. Maybe I get angry too easily. Where is it? Pray about it. Say, God, help me know what aspect of this. I need some maturity. Help me gain maturity. Because I want to be a person who can bear fruit. I pray that this church could be like an orchard of fruit trees. Just bearing fruit all over this place. Just giving gifts of spiritual graces to people in this community. And then because of that, the seeds of God's grace could be planted in North Reading and around this world. Amen. Okay, we've got Ray singing special music, fantastic. But first, let's pray for the offering. Right? Thank you, sir. Can you all stay ready? Do you want to come out? Let me pray for you. Here, hold on, Ray. we got to pray. We're going to pray for the offering. We need all the prayers we can get for money, right? Isn't that right? <laughs> Not true. God is uh, generous. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the gift you give us. Thank you for considering us your fruit trees. Help us to mature, um, to bear fruit. Just keep working with us. We know it takes time. Please receive this offering and bless it to your service in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. When you feel sad, always do a number like a brother to the soul of God.
This is the last Sunday in Epiphany, which means that next Sunday is the first Sunday in Lent, which is the season that helps us prepare for Easter. Lent starts on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. At, we're having a service at 7 p.m., and Union Congregational Church members will also be joining us as well. Uh, this is a midweek service, and we're busy people and work and have homework and school and everything. So it's a service from 7 to 7.30 on Wednesday night, just to come here and to be intentional about the start of Lent, uh, to get tools for helping to observe it in a faithful way. Uh, we also do the uh, imposition of ashes, which is getting a little cross on your forehead um, in ashes, just to remind us of our mortality. So all are welcome to that 7 p.m. service this coming Wednesday. Next Sunday after church, anyone who would like to come is invited to go see the movie version of The Shack. Many of us read The Shack five, six, seven years ago when it came out as a book, and it uh, looks to be a really well-cast, um, exciting movie. So it opens this week, uh, and we'll go for like a 1 or 1.30 show. The movie times haven't been listed at every theater that we're looking at. We have passes so we can get... Um, a little bit of a discount on the ticket if you let us know that you want to join the group. So let me know and we'll be in touch about exactly the time of the show and um, can talk about carpooling and from church and things like that. But probably about 1 o'clock, 1.30 next Sunday after church. There's new sign-up sheets out in the foyer. Uh, when you stand there to sign up for Liturgist Reader Act Life Coffee Hour, look down at the floor and look at the beautiful new tile that is right in that place. Uh, that's my bridge to the celebration and thanks. I, I know Norma asked uh, especially to say so, but I'll just announce it because we're short on time. Uh, we want to thank the floor, floor retailers, especially George Schofield, who just came in the door here a few weeks ago and jumped right into that project and showed a lot of leadership. So thank you.